God, I pray that you open up the hearts of your people, open up their ears, open up their eyes to see. I thank you for revelation, knowledge, and understanding. Um, but even more than that, God, I thank you for the application of it, even as we learn. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Um, so if I had a mess, if I, if I had a topic for this message this morning, um, I would have to use hide and seek. Somebody say hide and seek. Somebody say hide and seek. So we all know how this game goes. Um, and it's ironic, too, because even this morning, um, as, we, as I was getting Tyler ready, um, Taylor comes in the room and she's like, Daddy, let's play hide and seek. And I'm like, this girl is reading my notes. She's like, Daddy, let's play hide and seek. But I thought it was interesting because we know how the game goes. You know, one person counts and then one or two or however many other people, they run and hide and they say, ready or not, here I come. And then they go and they find whoever's been hidden, right? The purpose of this game is to hide from the seeker. Would everybody agree with that part? Would anybody agree with that part? The purpose of the game is to hide from the seeker, right? Whoever is the person who is covering up their eyes and counting, their whole goal and intent is to go out and find the people that are hiding. But the greatest joy in the game is not the fact that you've been able to hide and never be found, right? That's, that's one of the pieces of it. It's just like, oh, you weren't able to find me. But what happens when we hide and then the seeker stops pursuing? Right? What happens when we hide and it's going on so long now that we're like, okay, you know, are they still coming after me? It, like, it's a game. But the greatest joy, even though, even though the, the purpose of you hiding is for you to find such a great hiding spot for you not to be found, the greatest joy, the best reactions that you get out of the game is when they actually find you. Right? When they, when they pull the covers off and you're like, ah! You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the best part of the game when you're found. Would y'all agree with that part? That's the best part of the game when you're found. Otherwise, the purpose of the game or the intent of the game is not fulfilled, right? So would, so would you agree that if I'm the person counting and I cover my eyes and then I come out to try to find you and I never find you, what's the point of the game, right? It doesn't fulfill its purpose. There's no, there's no point. We're just wasting our time because I was never able to find you, right? And so some of us, sometimes we feel like, God, you're hidden. God, you don't hear me. God, I can't find you. God, I'm looking for you. God, I can't feel you. And so we almost feel like we're in this game where it's just like, okay, I'm ready to give up looking for you because I can't find you. It's no longer enjoyable. It used to be a joy. It, I used to have peace. Like It used to be exciting for me to pursue God, for me to worship, for me to go in my prayer closet, for me to throw up my hands, for me to lay on my face. It used to be exciting. I used to look forward to it when I woke up in the morning. Before I went to sleep at night, I used to look forward to it before I got into bed. But at some point, when you lose touch, at some point when he's not as easily accessible, at some point when you feel like he's not hearing your prayer and your request, then it's not fun anymore. Then it's not exciting. Then we start asking questions. Okay, God, why are you hiding? God, where are you? Marco! You know what I mean? And you're waiting for that echo, and you don't hear it, and you lose your zeal. You lose your passion, you use your joy, you, use, you, you lose that excitement because he's hidden, or more so because you can't find him. The Bible talks about a parable that says the kingdom of God is like a man who found a jewel out in a, um, out in a field. And he, he, he saw that this jewel was so priceless and of, of so much value that he went back home and sold everything he had to go out and pursue this jewel, right? The secrets of the uh, the secrets of the the kingdom, they're not hidden to hinder us. They're not hidden. They're not hidden to trip us up. It's not like God is just he's he's sitting back and he's and he's and he's hiding from us and he's just like I hope they never find me. You know what I'm saying? Like he's hidden for a reason, and that's what we're going to comb through a little bit this morning. The king, the the the. God being hidden is not to hinder us, but it's, it's to create a hunger in us. It's to create a passion, a drive on the inside of us that has us like, okay, I don't care what it takes, I am going after him. 
because if it were as easy as as you just laying back in your bed you open up your eyes i don't have to get out of bed today all i got to do is reach over to god and say all right god you know i love you close my eyes go back to sleep for the rest of the day i don't have to pursue him because it's just that he, he's just you know right there he's right beside me i don't have to go after him i don't have to find him even on the dating scene if it's too easy you don't even appreciate it, right? If, it, if, it's, if it's too easy, then you stop pursuing. If it's too easy, why do I have to open the door if you don't require that of me, right? Chivalry is not dead, it's just not a requirement for some people anymore, right? So if it's not a requirement, then I don't have to pursue. So sometimes with God, when it, when it, on the, in those seasons where it feels like it's so easy, then we become null or we become numb to what it takes to actually pursue. So then when it gets hard, so then when it gets rough, so then when we don't hear, so then when we don't feel them, we feel like, oh, well, I've never had to push this hard for God. But he knows exactly what he's doing because it's something that he's trying to get out of you in the process. I know I haven't read a scripture yet, but we're going to get to it because I got a lot I want to say tonight. So if you got notes, if you got a phone, if you got something you want to write down, there's going to be a whole lot of nuggets in here, I believe, that's going to help you out. One of the Greek translations or meanings for the word hidden, hidden, means to conceal. It's also something inward in nature. It's always something that's on the inside. If it's on the outside where people can see it, then it's not hidden. All right? It's concealed. I want you to write this down. God conceals your purpose to create passionate pursuit. God conceals your purpose to create passionate pursuit. That might not make sense right now, but it's gonna make sense in a second. There is a God-sized void that only God can fill. When we were born, we were born into sin, we were shaping in iniquity, and no matter how far you try to run away from God, no matter how far you feel like you are outside of the will of God, there's always this tug on the inside. Even before you fully committed your life to God, you might have feel like, oh, we have, I've never given God a chance, I've never even tried it, but I've always had this feeling on the inside like something was missing. There's always been something just kind of drawing me for some reason, right? Or if you've committed your life to God before, and now you're saying, hey, I want to rededicate myself. Hey, I want to get things right. Hey, I want to purify my heart. Hey, I want to do things the right way. And then you go away. You stray away. You get outside of the will of God. There's always something tugging. All, there's always something pulling you back because there is a God-sized void that only he can feel. This is not something that people can feel. It's not something that money can feel. It's not something that a job can feel. It's not something that a spouse or kids can feel. But it is a God-sized void, and he's the only one that can fill it up. But when these things are hidden, it creates that passionate pursuit in us for us to come hard after the heart of God. Write this down. God will never take away your right to discover him. God will never take away your right to discover him. I'll say it one more time. God will never take away your right to discover him. All right, as free moral agents, there is nothing that God, God and his spirit, he is a gentleman. He's not going to impose himself on us. All right, he doesn't take away our right to discover who he is. If he wanted to, he could easily say, he could easily just show up in your room one night while you're sleeping, bright light shows up and there's an angel, and the angel of the Lord says, hey, this is the Lord your God, and I want you to submit your life to him, and I want you to commit to doing the things of God, and I want you to give your life, and I want you to love him with all of your heart, right? He won't impose himself on you, all right? Love that's forced is not real love, right? Love has to have options. That's why he gave us over to sin, because he had to give us a choice to choose him so that we would know, so that he would know it was real, genuine love. And so sometimes we feel like we're being tested. It's hidden, but he's creating this passionate pursuit in us. But he leaves clues. He leaves hints for us to come after him. You don't believe me? Let's find it right here. Acts 17, 27. We'll finally read a verse after all of that. Acts 17, 27. Somebody say hide and seek. Hide and seek. Acts 17, verse 27. When you get there, say, I got it. Oh, man. 
Acts 17, 27. I'm going to read this out of the NIV version. Anybody got it yet? I don't want to rate at least for two people. At least for two people. Acts 17, 27. I'm going to read this out of the NIV version. Actually, let me back up. Um, let's read, let's start um, in verse 25. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and their boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him. Somebody say, so that they would seek him. God did this so that they would seek him. This is what he said. We got to go back to verse 26. He says, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out the appointed times in history and boundaries of their lands. All right, let me, let me make this make sense to you. Let me give you understanding for this. So when he said he's marked out their time, then basically what he's saying is the time that we're living in right now, he mapped this out before we were born. He knew what decade, he knew what century we needed to be born in to fulfill the purpose that he created us for. He knew the parents that we had to be born into in order for us to fulfill our purpose. Sometimes they're like, ah, oh, my parents ain't do nothing good for me. He knew the family that he needed to bring us into this world through in order to create something on the inside of us, right? And it might've been something that you considered as negative. It might've been something like, ah, oh, well, you know, I despise my father, I despise my mom, I despise what they did to me and how they treated me. I despise that they were never there, right? But even that in and of itself creates some type of drive and passion on the inside of you to say, you know what, I'll never do this to my children. You know what I'm saying? It's Still, it still has a beneficial reaction, right? But God knows where we need to be born. He gives us hints. He drops us these clues for us to find out what our purpose is. So if you want to find out, then you got to look at the clues. What city were you born in? What are some of the things about that city? What are some of the things about that city that makes that city thrive? What are some of the not so good things about that city. You got to think about the country that you were born into and the privileges that you have or the privileges that you might not have, right? Again, you got to think about your parents. You got to think about the way you were raised, the household that you came in, what was taught, what was not taught, right? You have to consider all of these things because all of these things are clues and hints as to what God has created you to do. Because he's saying right here in Acts 17, 27, God did this so that they would seek him, because here's the thing, it's hidden, right? His purpose is hidden from us. I remember so many times I used to pray like, God, show me your purpose. Show me your plan. What did you create me for? Show me my gifts. Show me my talents. And if it were that easy, I wish it were, right? But it's hidden. It is concealed for a reason. And this verse tells us so that we would seek him to find out. That's how Adam and Eve got in trouble in the garden. They got in trouble because God said, hey, you can have all of this food, but just don't touch that one tree. But then they went and ate the tree because they were deceived. But the reason they got in big trouble was because they pursued after the thing that God didn't want them to have, but without God. God wanted them to have the tree, but he didn't want them to have the tree without him. Right? That's why they got in trouble. These things are hidden from us for a reason, because sometimes if we understood, we'd mess it up. Right? And so we have to seek God in order to understand. We have to seek him in order to reach him and find him. You can write this down. When you're passionate about finding God, he'll position himself to be found by you. When you're passionate about finding God, he'll position himself to be found by you. I'll say it one more time. When you're passionate about God, he'll position himself to be found by you. In Psalms 27, David is talking and he's like, there's one thing that I desire of you. And that one thing is the thing that I'll seek after. But this is interesting to me. David was considered a man after God's own heart. Not only was he a man after God's own heart, but he was also a man that had everything. He 
was a king. He had riches, he had wealth, he had concubines, he had whatever he wanted, right? He had everything. But this is a man who still said in Psalms 27, four, he said, there's one thing that I desire. And you're like, what is this one thing you desire? I want to know because if, if I'm talking to somebody who's wealthy, who has a lot of money, and if you're wise, when you get around them, you won't say much. You'll just listen. You might just ask one open-ended question and just let them talk and just get all the knowledge and understanding. But if you go and you sit down with a wealthy person or with somebody who's very wise, right, you might ask a question. You might say, if there's one thing that you want, what is it? Because you got everything. If there's one thing that you want, what is it? So this is, this is David, essentially. He has everything. But he says, this one thing I desire, and that one thing I desire is the very thing I seek after. And that thing is to seek after God and his beauty. Isn't that amazing? Like, this is a man who has everything, but he's saying, I only desire one thing, and that's to seek after God. This is a man who the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. And this is one of the reasons. Because he had everything but still only wanted one thing. He had everything but still only wanted one thing. So sometimes we get sidetracked because we're like, oh, but there's so many other things that I need. I need to pay this bill. I need to be loved. I need satisfaction. You know what I mean? I need a new job. I need promotion. And so a lot of times when we have all of these different voids, then it's hard for us to try to pinpoint and focus really on God and say, oh, well, the only thing that I really need is God. Because in reality, when you hear people say things like, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't need money. I don't need a house. I don't need a car. The only thing I need is God. And the first thing you think is like, bruh. Seriously, like you could tone it down just a little bit. Like you don't have to be that spiritual. Like you still have needs, right? But what he's saying is whether I have everything or whether I don't, just like Paul said later, right? I've still learned the secret to contentment. And that is whether I have a little bit, I got God. Whether I have a lot, I have God, right? Regardless of the matter, I, that's what I'm seeking after. And that's the one thing that I'm hard after. Sincerity will turn the seeker into the sought out. Sincerity will turn the seeker into the sought out. There's a turning point in our seeking God where, just like I said, in hide and seek, where you have the person that's covering up their eyes and then everybody else, they runs and they hide, right? So the person who is seeking, they're going after the person that's hidden. Right, so this is us pursuing God. Sometimes it feels like God is hidden. Sometimes it feels like God is concealed. Sometimes it feels like we can't hear him, we don't see him, we can't quite put our hands on him, but he's pulling out a passion and a desire on the inside of us that's driving us to come after him even harder. But at some point, that seeking flips. At some point, there's a turning point where now, instead of seeking, we're being sought after. There's a point where the sincerity of our heart changes the heart of God to the point where he's like, okay, I've seen how hard they're coming after me. Now I have to do something. Now I have to come after them, right? Meeting God almost in the middle, but us not thinking in our minds, okay, I'm gonna just come halfway and just see what God's gonna do. In my mind, my intent is to meet God wherever he is. But at some point where your heart is purified, then it turns and God says, I have to do something. I have to get off of this throne and I have to go and see what they're doing. Because right now there's some type of sweet smell coming up from their worship and I gotta go join in on what's going on, right? Anytime somebody is talking real good about you, you wanna get in on the conversation. Anytime somebody's talking real bad about you, sometimes you wanna get in on the conversation. <laughs> but more times than not, when somebody is complimenting you, right? Somebody speaks well to you. Somebody say, hey, you look nice today. You know, it happens on a regular basis. You want to be around those types of people, right? You all, and, and you might not be fishing for a compliment per se, but you're kind of still thinking about it in the back of your head. Like, oh, you know, they're always complimenting. They're always saying good things about me. You like to be around people like that. And so when, when, when you're seeking God, in his mind, he's thinking like, oh, they're coming after me. Oh, they're telling me how awesome I am. They're telling me how great I am. I need to be around them. I need to go after them to where the seeker becomes the sought after, right? A pure heart will turn the pursuer into the pursued. 
a pure heart will turn the pursuer into the pursued. David was a man after God's own heart. Not just because he was such a good person, but it was because, part, partly because at the pinnacle of his success, he fell. At the, at the pinnacle of his, of his success, when he was the greatest that he would become in his life, that is the point that he committed adultery. And then on top of that, ended up killing the husband of the wife. And then tried to cover it up. This is King David, a man after God's own heart. But he wasn't considered a man after God's own heart just because he was so good at seeking God and because he was so perfect. He was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says, because he had a contrite heart and a broken spirit, right? A heart that was always easily broken, a heart that was so tender to the voice of God that at any given moment, even in his sin, he could still hear the whisper of God, right? Y'all have... It doesn't happen all the time, because sometimes when we're doing the wrong thing, sometimes the voice is kind of blurred, sometimes it's, it's kind of faint, sometimes it's really quiet, right? But when you have a pure heart, you can do the wrong thing and you can hear the voice of God so clearly and so loudly. When you have a pure heart, right? When you are sincere in heart, when your heart is contrite, when you are broken in spirit for the things of God, no matter what you do, no matter how far you think you can stray away, you're always right beside him. He's always right there. And it doesn't even take for you to have to repent for it sometimes, not all the time, sometimes. It doesn't even take for you to have to repent in order for you to hear that voice because he's always, that still whisper like, I still love you. I'm still here. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm waiting for you to be found by you. So even though we say he's hidden, but like I said in the Greek, one of the translations is concealed in, of inward nature. So it's almost like, let me see, does anybody have a coffee cup? If you have a coffee cup, you can't see the contents, right? So in our, in our English language, what we've been accustomed to is hidden is not necessarily, I can see it, right? But hidden is more so like, it's out of sight, right? In our English language. But in the Bible, in the Hebrew language of how they spoke that day, their definition of hidden was different from ours. Their definition of hidden wasn't out of sight. Their definition of hidden was that it's within reach. But we just can't see it. It was beyond sight. It was, it's here. I, I see the cup. I know God is there. And, and, and in the back of our minds, even when we're struggling, even when we're experiencing difficulty, we still never really get to the point of atheism where we're just like, okay, God just doesn't exist. How is it possible that he could let me... Now, I've been kind of on that border. I've been on that border where it's just like, you ask those questions where it's just like, okay, God, how could you be so good and let all these bad things happen? But never to the point where you just kind of cancel out God completely. Because there's no way that you can look at the flowers, that you can look at the clouds, that you can see the sunrise and set every single day, that you can see these seasons and patterns of life and not think that somebody greater than us created it, right? So it's like we see God and we know he's there, but it's like the contents on the inside is, is hidden. God, what's my purpose? I see the cup and I see different hints. I, this is a hint of coffee, right? This is a clue of coffee. When you see the cup, automatically you think, oh yeah, that's a coffee cup. There's probably coffee in there. That would be a good hypothesis. That would be a good, a good thought because it is a coffee cup. So you assume coffee is in there but it's hidden. And the only way for you to figure out what's in the content is for you to seek it out. It's for you to pull the top off or, or for you to taste it, right? You do that to pull the top off, you'd have to use your senses. You can smell, pull the top off, you can taste, whatever you need to do, but you can figure out what the content is on the inside. But the only way that you can figure out what's on the inside is for you to seek. Somebody say seek. Bible says that we, if we seek, then we'll find. We knock, the door will be open. But he's creating a passionate pursuit on the inside of us. There's a difference between looking and seeking. Some of us might feel like, oh, you know, I've been looking for God for years, but I just never found him. Um, one of my friends I talked to is just kind of like, um, 
you know, we had a we had a real conversation and he's one of those people that's kind of what I say is God conscious where he's just like he knows God is real, but still at the same time, it's just like I have so many questions that I'm not quite ready to commit to this. So he's God conscious. I believe that he loves God, but he still does a lot of kind of borderline gray area things that could be considered sinful, right? But one of the things I asked him, I was just like, well, um, well I got to give this preface as well. He is a, um, he's a spoken word artist and a rapper, does poetry, whatever, all of that. And so in a lot of his pieces, he talks about real life and just where he is right now. And so a lot of the stuff that he talks about, a lot of the, a lot of the situations are unresolved. It's just a bunch of pieces that are about problems and struggle. And it's just like, all right, I get it. Like, I can relate. I've been there, done that. All right, I, I can relate to you, but where's the resolve? So one time I just bluntly asked and I was just like, hey, um, so, you know, I listened to this piece, I listened to that, you know, I listened to that, but, but where are you with this? You know, was the problem ever solved? Like, did you ever resolve this or like, are you still kind of in it? And he's kind of like, well, when something happens, then I'll change what I write about. When it's resolved, then there will be a resolution in the music, right? But until then, it just, what it is what it is. And so essentially what he was saying was, I'm looking for it, but I've not found it yet. But once I find it, then I'll have it, right? Looking is different from seeking. Looking is, all right, I have a bunch of options. I'm looking for God, but if something else comes in the form of God or looks a little bit like God, then I'll take it, right? But seeking is intentional. Seeking is direct. Seeking is, hey, I put my blinders on, my focus and my intent is on God, and anything else doesn't even matter. Everything else is blurred out, right? I used to have a motorcycle. I don't anymore because once we had kids, somebody felt like I was being selfish because if I were to get in an accident, I would leave them with the kids by herself. <laughs> but when I did, so like, man, there was, there, was, there was this highway in Richmond, Virginia. It was just like this stretch, maybe like a good, probably like 20 miles of nothing but highway. Speed limit was only 70. I'm not gonna say how fast I was going. All I would say is, I just had to test it one time just to open it up just to see how hard it could ride. So, once you go a certain speed on a bike, not sure if anybody else has been on a bike before, but once you go a certain speed, everything else except what's directly in front of you is completely blurred. You see absolutely nothing on both sides. You know trees are there, but all you see is just kind of a blur of green and it's just a street. You don't see signs. You don't see police cars. You don't see anybody broke down on the side of the road. I'm not going to ask any questions. <laughs> but all you see is exactly what's in front of you. Nothing is, I mean, it's, it's it's dangerous, but you're going so fast that nothing on the side is visible. It's just all a blur. But that's the difference between looking and seeking. Seeking is direct. There's blinders on the side, but looking is optional. I'm almost finished, y'all. Let me read this part so I can give you even more understanding. Looking includes sight. Seeking goes beyond sight. Looking is, God, I don't see you. I'm peeking out the window, God, for you to show up to my address because I gave you my address and I told you that I needed you and I'm waiting for you to show up. That's looking, all right? Somebody else might show up and you'll say, oh, okay, well, you know, I was looking for God, but you showed up and you, you'll do, right? Seeking is, no, nobody else is gonna do. All right. Seeking is I'm not even going to look out the window anymore. I'm going to just, I'm, God, I, I, you know what I need. And until that thing shows up, I'm going to keep on seeking. I'm going to stop just running around and looking for everything to pacify my situation. But I know exactly what I'm looking for and I won't settle for anything less. Right. That's seeking. Seeking is direct. It's intentional. Let's give, um, I, have to give, I have to give the Greek and Hebrew translation of this because again, you know, our idea of seeking in the English language is totally different from their day and what it actually was intended for and what it was meant in the Bible. This is, what, this is some of the definitions for the word seek in the Greek. It means to demand, to demand. That sounds a lot different from looking. To require, that sounds a lot different from looking. 
to investigate, to reach a binding solution. Right? God, I am after you, and I'm not going to let this go until there is a resolve. Right? Getting to the bottom of a matter. And then the last one is any method specifically in worship and in prayer. Seeking any method specifically in worship and in prayer. Any method specifically in worship and in prayer. Seeking God wholeheartedly, right? You can write this down. God is well within reach, but you're restricted by religion. That religion word is tough. Might mess up some of y'all philosophy with this one. God is well within reach, but you're restricted by religion. Y'all know what religion is, right? Y'all know what religion is. Let me give it to you in layman's terms. Religion is finding God on our own terms. Religion is, religion is, God, I want to make the rules about how I want my Christian life to go, right? And I want you to be okay with it. Religion is, okay, I see what this says in the word of God, but can we just alter the scripture just a little bit because it makes me a little bit uncomfortable, right? That's religion. Religion is, here are the Ten Commandments, so if I just follow all of these rules and regulations, then I'll be okay with God. That's religion, right? Religion is a set of rules, a set of standards, a, standard, a, a set of beliefs, right, that we have to abide by in order to be in right standing with God. I have to explain this another day, but this is where grace comes in, right? This is where grace comes in and knocks out the law and says, okay, now we're not under religion anymore, but now we're under grace. Now it's not just about the laws, because guess what? You are going to break the law. At some point, you're going to mess this thing up. But there's something greater than you that's more powerful than sin, that's more powerful than breaking the law, and that's grace. I have to break that down another day. But that's, that's religion, is the set law, thinking that, okay, if I just do the right things, then I'll get by with God. Religion is fitting him in to our belief of what we think he's like. Fitting him into our box and saying, oh, you know what, I got God figured out. This is, what, this is who God is. This is how he acts. This is what he does. Every time I do this, he does this. Watch this, watch this. Every time I say this, he responds. Every time I say this word in church, everybody gets up and shouts. Every time I do this in church, everybody gets up and screams, right? It's thinking we have God figured out to a routine, right? That's religion and leaving no room for God to throw us off leaving no room for God to surprise us, leaving no room for God to show us a facet of himself that we don't even know about him yet, right? In the Bible, um, I think it's in the book of Acts, they set up all of these idols, and they were worshiping all of these Greek gods. We'll have to dig into that one day too. So they had up all of these Greek idols set up that everybody was worshiping, and all of the idols had a specific purpose. But then there was one in the middle, there was one in the middle, and the label for this Greek God, he didn't even have a name, so they named it the unknown God. So Paul walks up, and he says, you guys are very religious, and I'll give, I'll give you the verse for this so y'all can check me on it and do whatever you want with it. He says, you guys are very religious because you've set up all of these idols to worship, but the very thing that you're worshiping, you're ignorant about. Because you, you set up an idol that says, to the unknown God. And basically what they were saying is, there's a God out there that we don't know about. Let's worship the ones that we know about, but let's try to fit him into what we know about these other gods. And so let's just slap a label on it and we'll worship this unknown God. But the intent of us worshiping this unknown God is just so that we can fit him into our religious ceremonies, right? But then Paul came and he said, this God that you worship, you're ignorant about. You don't even know about this unknown God. Let me tell you about him. Right? And then he educated them about the God of the universe, about sovereign God, and let him know what they were worshiping. Right? Religion is ignorance in worship. Ignorant worship is religion. 
when we, I, I'm going to break this down as simple as possible. And there's no judgment. There's no condemnation because I've been there. I promise you when we're in a worship service and the only reason I lift up my hands is because everybody else is doing it. I don't know why my hands are lifted up in the air. I just got them up just because that's what you're supposed to do when you come in church. In ignorance, right? In ignorance just means you don't know, right? It's not a cuss word. It doesn't mean you're a horrible person. It just means you don't know. So I have my hands up in worship just because that's what everybody's, and that's what you're supposed to do in church, but in ignorance. That is religion, right? Okay, everybody's laying on their face and everybody's crying out to God. So, all right, so maybe that's what I should do. Let me get on my knees or let me lay down, you know, let me lay prostrate, right? But not knowing why you're doing it, but just doing it out of formality because that's what you're supposed to do or that's what everybody else is doing. That is religion, right? But that's not religion to the person who knows what they're doing, right? So you can't walk up in there and say, oh, this is so religious. Look at everybody just screaming out in tongues and with their hands up and laying on their face. Oh, they're being so religious because it's routine, right? It's not religious, right? It's only religious because it's ignorant because you don't know the reason for it. And that's what Paul said. He said, you're ignorant of the very thing that you're, worship, that you're worshiping. Therefore, you're missing the whole point. So that's why even when I was a, I was a child, the type of church that I, 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 I came up in was a type of church that if you did not spit and backflip over the pews and knock over stuff, and, and if we didn't shout and scream and, and lay hands and everybody falls out, then we didn't have church, right? To the point where you got, I'm, there's kids your age who will be running around the church, shouting, spitting, screaming, not speaking in tongues, but just that's what everybody is doing. So let me just yell at the top of my lungs like everybody else is yelling, but not understanding. So you get a little bit older and now you kind of get in this cycle of doing it. And now you're 30, 40 years old and still doing it and not having an understanding of what it is, right? So worship is not just music. Worship is not just lifting our hands. Worship is not how good the musicians and the singers sound. Worship is a posture of our heart. I could, I could be sitting down in my chair while worship is going on. Somebody else could be up there, hands up in the air, tears coming down their face, screaming out. But naturally, it looks like the person who's screaming, making all the noise with the hands up and they're crying and they're bawling. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But it appears that that person is much more spiritual, right? But you can be sitting there like DJ is right now with your arms folded. I know, I ain't messing with you. You can be, you can be sitting there looking mug face, looking real mean, looking however you want to. But on the inside of your heart, the posture of your heart is, God, whatever you want to do with me, I'm cool with it. They might be singing a song like, I give myself away, and everybody's, God, you can have me do whatever you want with me. And you're just sitting there in your chair, and you're battling with yourself. This has been me before. You're battling, and you're like, I'm not going to sing this song because I'm not ready to give that type of commitment to God yet. Because I'd rather not commit and then later come back and say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Then for me to commit... And then later on have to say, you know what, God, I wasn't ready. The Bible speaks to that as well. It's better that a man says no and later comes back and says yes than for you to say yes and then later come back and say no. Right? I'd rather sit in my seat and say, you know what, I can't sing that song quite yet because I need my heart to be pure. And if I sing that song right now, it's, it's not coming from a pure place because I don't mean it. So let me just sit here with my mouth shut. And I'm, I promise you this. In some of those situations, it took me weeks before I could sing some of those songs. It took me weeks, still coming, still coming, still showing up to church, but not being able to open up my mouth to sing it because I wanted my heart to be pure in it. So I saw myself sitting in the chair, everybody's up clapping and people were coming by like, hey, you okay? I'm perfect, I'm doing great. People were coming up like, hey, you know, you gonna clap your hands, hey, you gonna lift your hands? And I'm like, bro, like, leave me alone, like I'm good. But just sitting in the chair, but once I got to a place in my heart where I was ready, I didn't have to lift my hands. I didn't have to scream it out loud for everybody to hear it. It was just, all right, God, I give myself away. Sitting there in your seat, giving God the most pure worship. Because the worship is not just in this setting, right? The worship is at home. The worship is driving in your car. The worship is at work when you can make a decision to say, you know what, God, right now I don't feel like doing it, 
but I'm going to do it because I gave my life to you last week. You know what, God? I don't feel like doing it today, but last week I told you in worship, my life is not my own. I'm giving it to you, so now I got to follow through on it. That is worship, a posture of the heart. Sincerity, right? That is worship. When we're able to open up and say, God, whatever you want, you can have it, right? But we're only restricted by our religion. I'll end on this part right here. Worship is not defined by a place. And when I say worship, I'm talking about seeking God as well. Worship is not defined by a place. It's a position of your heart. And then seeking God is not a posture of your hands, but the passion of your pursuit. Seeking God is not the posture of your hands, but the passion of your pursuit. In Acts 17, 24, it says that God does not live in temples built by human hands. He dwells in contrite hearts and broken spirits. <clears throat> and then Paul goes on to say, in the past, God overlooked this ignorance, but no longer. But now he requires repentance. In the past, God overlooked the ignorance of you coming in every week and not knowing what you're doing. But now he requires repentance. Repentance, even in of itself, is not always, again, screaming and crying or, you know, I'm so sorry and I feel so horrible. Repentance is, is, is really simple. Repentance is just, hey, I don't want to do that anymore. Right? But it's not just making a change and saying I don't want to do that anymore because you can't just say no to something without saying yes to something else. Right? So if you say no to one thing, you have to say yes to something else. So then you say, okay, no, I don't want to do this anymore. All right, God, I'm ready to do this. Right? Your servants to whomever you yield yourself to obey. If I give this my yes, then I'm saying no to something else. All it is is turning from whatever you've been doing and seeking God. That's all repentance is in its simplest form. So he's saying, you know, God has allowed us to get by on this ignorance for long enough, but now we need to change how we do it. Now we need to change how we seek. No longer seeking God ignorantly, right? No longer seeking God just out of routine. You know, um, you know, I'm supposed to have my quiet time today, or I'm supposed to pray right when I get out of bed. I'm supposed to pray right before I go to bed. But man, has God ever arrested you in the middle of the day? Like, has God ever called your number while you were at work? Have you ever been driving in your car and you just feel like the presence of God come over you? Like, has he ever caught you off guard? Where it's like, I wasn't even pursuing him, but he came after me. Like, it happens when our hearts are pure, when we're sincere, when we're not bound or restricted by religion, but we let him outside of this box and give him permission. I'm about to say something foul right now. When we give him permission to wake us up at two o'clock in the morning, because he wants to talk to us, all right? I know, DJ, that hurts, because I ain't get no sleep. God, you want to tap me on my shoulder in the middle of the night? Or let's, 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 let's be more realistic. You have a dream that you know is spiritual, that you know has some type of meaning, right? Something that's just so deep, you're like, I could not have conjured this up myself. You wake up two, three o'clock in the morning and you remember the dream because it's so fresh. And you're like, I have to write this down because I have to remember this. But what do you do? You turn over and you go back to sleep. And guess what happens? Nine times out of 10, you don't remember that dream. If do you know how many songs I got in the middle of the night that I did not record or write down? Wake up in the morning like, yeah, I missed that one. But letting God outside of our box that we put him in to be able to come to us whenever he wants to, for him to be able to speak to us whenever he desires to, to the point where, all right, God, I was seeking you, but now when I'm just at work, just minding my own business, now you're coming after me. Right. I was seeking you, but now I'm just driving in the car, not even paying any attention. And now I'm looking at the flowers and now I'm feeling the breeze and breathing in the air. And I'm feeling like, God, wow, you're amazing. Just out of nowhere. I'm just having these feelings of just appreciation. Right. That's when God is pursuing us, where the seeker turns into the sought after. You can stand to your feet. Message is complete. I believe I've said what I believe God has given me this this morning. <clears throat> so I always feel like, you know, if I've given what I believe that God has given me, I never like to belabor it. <clears throat> 
anymore, and I believe that y'all got it as well. Father, we thank you again for your word today. God, I thank you for each individual. I thank you even for each family represented by each individual that is here this morning. God, I thank you for your word, and I believe that you have given me what to say this day, that you want us to have a passion and a desire to seek after you. And the things that are hidden, even your word says that there are, there are things in the kingdom that are hidden, but they're not hidden from believers. They're hidden from unbelievers. And for us, all we have to do is seek you to find. If we're looking for our purpose, if we're looking for our gifts and our talents or the things that God has created us to do in this life, he set it up intentionally that way for us not to know so that we would seek him, so that we had not discover it apart from him, so that we'd be able to enjoy it with him. God, so we're asking you this morning, Lord, to increase our desire, our passion for you, to stir us up on the inside until nothing else matters, until nothing else will pacify it, until nothing else will satisfy us. A desire, a longing, a hunger, and a thirst for you. So much so sometimes that we're not even hungry for natural food, but that that spiritual hunger and thirst takes over in pursuit of you. And I thank you for it, that you're doing it in all of us and all of us that would receive in the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> God, I thank you. Thank you, God. All right, so this morning, I'm, I'm going to do things a little bit different just because I feel led um, by the Spirit of God, or at least He's impressed it on me this morning. Um, this morning, if there's anybody here who, who you say, and you know what? I need my passion. I need my desire restored. I need it renewed. I need it refreshed. Um, I've been looking for God, but I haven't been seeking Maybe I've been walking in his direction, but I haven't been running towards him. And maybe this morning you just want somebody to agree with you. You just want prayer um, just to have that desire and that passion resurrected, to have it restored. So that when you seek God, he'll give you hind's feet. <clears throat> what that means is that you just feel really light in your pursuit of God, where you don't feel heavy, where you're able to lay down the weights that so easily beset you and distract you and be able to run in full stride without hindrance or distraction. <clears throat> That's anybody this morning, again, we're not gonna belabor it or we're not gonna take too long with it, but I just wanna stand in agreement with you and I just wanna pray with you. If that's anybody this morning, um, if you just want prayer for that this morning, you can just go ahead and step out of your seats and uh, come up to the front and we'll just pray with you briefly. Glory to God. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. We'll just pray this morning. <clears throat> and that prayer will be for myself as well. We've, we've not attained or we've never achieved, um, but just always wanting more and always wanting to be desperate, even more for God, having an insatiable desire, one that cannot be satisfied. Every time we have more of him, we want more of him. Every time we find him, we want to find him again. That's what we're praying for this morning. So even as we pray, um, if you feel like as we're praying, you still want to come up, then feel free. Um, and again, we're not going to do this for long, but I just want to do what I believe that God has given me to do. Um, and then we'll move on. Father, I thank you. And even as I pray, if it's anybody who is not up here, who still wants to receive, you can just go ahead and lift up your hands even as we pray to receive. God, I thank you for my brother who stepped up this morning. And I thank you even for the people that he is representing, maybe that may, maybe want to be up here, but that are not. God, but I thank you that you are restoring a passion on the inside, God. God, I pray that you are resurrecting a desire on the inside that he has not known or that he has not seen. God, I thank you that there is a fire deep on the inside that maybe that has been suppressed. God, that you will unleash on the inside of him to the point that he cannot control it. God, I thank you that he would let loose the gifts and the desire on the inside of him and no longer try to reel it back in. God, that, that he would let you loose in his life, God. God, I thank you, not just him, but in all of us, Lord. 
God, I thank you for power. I thank you for passion. God, I thank you for desire. God, I pray that you would fan the flame on the inside of him, that it would be contagious. God, that everybody who encounters him will see and know your desire and your passion on his life. That everybody who comes in contact with him, God, will feel the heat from his fire. Glory to God. God, I thank you that you would open up his eyes to see you, even in the night watch, in the middle of the night. God, when others are sleeping, that you'll be stirring up the gifts.